Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be back. I have been touched by the messages I've received since my COVID diagnosis was confirmed. Thank you very much. I'm through the symptoms now, but I do have to share with you that it is a horrid and debilitating condition. I have remained engaged throughout my period of isolation, chairing our national strategy group remotely every morning, but I've certainly missed our daily press conferences. Getting back to the old routine, I would like to invite the Minister for Health and Social Care to cover today's statistics. David. Thank you, Chief Minister, and can I say it's great to have you back. The total number of tests undertaken now is 2,554. We have had 2,503 of those tests back, meaning we have 51 test results outstanding. The total number of confirmed cases now stands at 307, which means we have seven new cases since yesterday. Can I also take the opportunity to thank Manchester for their processing of tests since the start of this until we could get the on Ireland facility up and running. I also want to clear up some confusion that there appeared to be this morning um, in terms of the reporting. Today was, of course, the first day of on Ireland testing. And as a result, there has only been one batch today of tests to report on. The times of reporting previously were simply to comply with the daily return times of the batches from Manchester. Now we have on Ireland testing, these times may now vary. And with the on Ireland testing, we are now likely to report later in the morning to allow the overnight batches processed on Ireland to be included as they finish processing at 10am. But we are also looking to automate the reporting system, which currently is compiled manually. So expanding on a question I was asked yesterday by Paul, although for now we will continue to report twice a day, longer term once the automation is up and running, I have asked that we look to see if we can combine it all into one daily report, which I think personally will be less confusing for the public at large and make the figures easier to follow on a daily basis. So I've asked for that to be looked at when the automated testing comes in place. Thank you, Chief Minister. And thank you, David. Now, I'm pleased to pass on my thanks to your colleagues for the Herculean work that they are all putting in. Last Friday, the Treasury Minister told this press conference about the work that was being undertaken by colleagues from across government to look at how and when the Isle of Man might be able to move to new stages in dealing with COVID-19. I will share with you shortly the results of their work. But first, I think it is important for me to set the context. As an island, we find ourselves in a fortunate position. For many, this might be difficult to hear. For those who have lost loved ones, I would never seek to belittle that pain. Every death is, of course, a tragedy. Or for those who have lost jobs or for companies who are struggling, I know it may seem that there is no way out. But we just need to take a step back and look beyond our shores. Our friends across Europe and across the world are suffering the most dreadful scenes. It is still not clear if the United Kingdom has reached its own peak, but the death toll is already over 16,000 people. The global death toll is 10 times that. This is, this is catastrophic. Relative to the UK and others, we have so far escaped the worst ravages of this virus. Our health and care sectors still have capacity. We still have good stocks of PPE. Our staffing levels are solid. We have beds available. How did we get here? It was certainly not by luck. It was, of course, thanks to some incredible work by our health and social care professionals and the teams that support them. And what they have ch achieved has been nothing short of miraculous. I would like to take you through a few key achievements. Working with colleagues from the Department of Infrastructure, our Department of Health and Social Care has commissioned a new ward and other important critical health facilities at Nobles. DOI have also installed our own oxygen production facility the provision of oxygen is a challenge across the United Kingdom. 
we will shortly be able to produce our own. Our on-island testing facility is now up and running. This will allow us to conduct around 200 tests a day without having to send them off-island. Well done to everyone involved in delivering this. We have doubled our ICU capacity and importantly have trained staff to work on it. Working with the Department for Enterprise colleagues, the Department of Health and Social Care have established solid global procurement of personal protection equipment beyond our regular NHS supply chains. Government has developed expert analytical tools to support policy development, contact tracing and cluster investigations. This has been a team effort. This is thanks to the DHSSC leadership and the army of people who have supported them. Help has come from across our public, private and voluntary sectors. All of this work has helped our health and social care system to be ready. But I have missed one important category of people who have made this possible. And that is you. We set you all a challenge. We asked you to make changes to your lives. We asked you to act differently, to live differently. And you are doing it. You rose to the challenge. The vast majority of our island has shown the very best of Manx. You have been resilient, determined and courageous. By making the choices that you did, you have got us to where we are now. You have helped us drive down the growth rate of the virus on our island. You brought us one thing we didn't have at the start of all of this. Time. Time to be as ready as we could be for the next chapter. <clears throat> as we go forward, a crucial weapon in our arsenal will be testing and contract tracing, all based around high quality data. We have been able to test en masse. Per capita, we currently rank ninth in the world. We now have a facility on Ireland that can progress about 200 tests a day. This has allowed us to gather crucial data. Testing for testing's sake can be a blunt weapon, but we have been able to use the data we have gleaned from testing, contract te um, tracing, the 111 line and elsewhere. We are often talking about the invisible enemy. What you have achieved by staying at home is to help us see where COVID was so that we could break the chain. We called upon everyone on the island to step up to protect our health and social care services. And you did it. We asked you to suppress this virus and to flatten the curve. And you did it. We asked you to get us away from the blue curve and closer to the yellow curve. And you did it. Because of this, because of the seriousness with which you have taken the situation, we are able to share with you today the changes we will be making as we move to the next stage of our plan. Our first priority has always been the preservation of life, and that remains the case. The Council of Ministers has been clear that it will never put the economy before the lives of our people. But now that we have the time to do so, we can broaden our thinking and our actions. Over the last weeks, the decisions the Council of Ministers and I have had to make have been heart-wrenching. I hope our successors will not be faced with the same. We knew our lives would be turned upside down. We knew livelihoods would be lost and we knew lives would be lost. Today, the decisions the Council of Ministers and I have made continue to be challenging and we feel the weight of that responsibility. In addition to our responsibility for the protection of life, we now believe that the time has come to look ahead. The drastic measures we were forced to take were the right thing to do in the short term, but in the medium and long terms, closing down society can call real risks to our well-being. Whether this is from having to close down all the healthcare pathways as we had to do, 
or whether this is the pressure on our mental health that isolation or financial challenges can bring, or whether this is the increase in domestic abuse reports that we have seen. We cannot ignore these risks. We have to balance them against the risks directly from the virus, and we need to have a plan that will sustain us over the months to come. This is a marathon, not a sprint. The economy is critical to this plan. We have to be realistic that we do not have a bottomless pit of money. Without an economy, we have no healthcare system. As the Treasury Minister mentioned on Friday, a cross-government task force has been working on if, how and when we can make changes. The challenge government set them was formidable. They worked hand in glove with all of our senior public health and clinical experts. I am delighted that together they have agreed on our next steps. The Council of Ministers has now also agreed this approach. I am pleased to tell you that from the morning of the 24th of April there will be two broad areas of change. Firstly, on construction and related trades. Many countries around us chose not to stop construction work. It has continued, for example, in the United Kingdom. We made a different decision at the time. We chose to bring in tougher measures in order to suppress the virus as much as possible and as quickly as possible. From this Friday, builders, construction workers, tradesmen, window cleaners and gardeners may return to work providing that they do so safely and within social distancing guidelines. Businesses that support this activity, such as hardware stores and builders merchants, can also operate, providing again that they do so safely, respecting social distancing and other guidelines. Supporting services such as waste and recycling points will also be able to operate, once again providing that they can do so safely respecting social distancing and other guidelines. I have to be very clear that we will be approaching this change with our eyes open. While we have offered this flexibility to the construction sector, we will not hesitate to close down construction sites, retail premises, industrial units or any other premises where there is disregard for public or workforce safety. We will publish full details of the sectors and trades covered by this change tomorrow. The second area of change is for people. With the agreement of our clinicians, we are now able to develop our approach. As I've said before, there are real harms that flow from a sustained lockdown environment. We want to do what we can to ease these in a gradual, managed and clinically driven manner. From Friday, we will no longer limit your time out of your home. There will be no longer be a requirement for this to be essential reasons only. We will be widening the recreation that you can undertake to include activities that can be done in a safe and socially distanced way. We will be publishing guidelines ahead of on, on Friday. You can continue to go to public spaces but please keep your distance from others. I do need to make clear, staying at home when you can is still important. If you can, then please do so. This is not about relaxing our measures, but we are adjusting them to achieve a more sustainable, fairer and healthier balance. We have proved that as a community, we understand the importance of social distancing. We need you to keep doing that and demanding that others respect your space too. We are not, and I repeat not, yet ready to relax the rules banning public gatherings with people who are not part of your household. Breaking the chain of transmission from house to house has made such an important difference to reducing the spread of the virus. We need to keep doing that. Neither are we ready to change the requirement that people must, wherever possible, work from home. Again, we will be shortly be publishing more detailed guidance on these new measures on our website. 
and for the avoidance of doubt, we will not be opening our borders. This has made a real difference. The time is not right to open up, not least given the challenges the United Kingdom is facing. Despite the changes we have been able to announce today, we need to keep up our vigilance and do the right thing. Over the next weeks, we will continue to test, to trace and to treat. We will continue to analyse the data. We will scrutinise infection rates in real times. We will then review the situation at the end of the first week in May. If we remain within the capacity of our health and social care sector, then we may, and I repeat may, be able to take further steps towards normality in a manageable, measured and clinically driven way. This is the next stage in our plan. This is not the beginning of the end. There remains a long road ahead and the challenges will be considerable. But this could be the end of the beginning. We will continue to share our thinking and our ana analysis with you as we go forward. Your actions are what is going to make the difference. We need you to continue to play your part. These changes have only been possible because you have taken the measures seriously. You self-isolated when you had symptoms. You respected social distancing. You washed your hands. You need to keep doing this. I will now take questions. And I think the first we have is Energy FM and it's Chris Cave. Welcome back, Chief Minister. It's good to see <clears throat> you've made a recovery. Um, when it comes to the easing of the restrictions that you've just outlined, how much communication have you had with business leaders in the sectors affected? Because, and I use construction as an example of this, workers may be concerned they're being used as the proverbial guinea pigs to test if it is indeed safe enough to go back to work. Well, I think what's happened is that our, our, our medics and our teams have looked at what are the industries that we felt was the next step where self, social um, distancing could be maintained and there was the lowest risk and our medics worked up which industries they felt were able to go back to work and they came up with the construction industry, gardening, landscaping and window cleaning, etc. So that's what they came up with. We, we have not been forced by the construction industry to um, get back to um, get them back to work. This has been done as part of a managed staged approach. And I think going forward, it will be one step at a time. We're not going to see big jumps and sudden changes. It will be make a change, look at the data. Has it worked? And if it has worked, then we will be moving on on the next um, stages as we go forward. So certainly not um, the, the safety of the island, the health of all of everyone on the Isle of Man, including our construction workers, is absolutely key. Next question, Chris. Yes, you, you told Tinwald earlier that the peak of the coronavirus on the island has been identified next month, the, the 7th to the 10th of May. How key a moment is that in our response to the pandemic? Are you able to shed more detail and provide more information about what changes we're likely to see from the current situation when we do reach that point? Well, actually, since I, when, when, I, when I said that, it was slightly misleading of me. Um, that was the data when we first um, came up with, with the, of, of all the figures on, on where we were going. Since the Manx public have fantastically responded to the requests of social distancing and staying at home, etc., then that curve has come down even lower. And... Um, we don't know the exact date of, of the peak. Um, we, who knows, we could be going through it now. So that data has changed since the start of um, the record um, keeping that we'd been going. We had expected it to be the 7th, 9th, 10th of May, but the curve has come down significantly. I think when we started out, it was 16, 18%. And recently, we've got it down to 7%, which is absolutely phenomenal. And it's all down to the hard work and seriousness that the Manx public have taken in, in working with all our professionals. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Thank you very much, Chris. And next, we have Alex from the BBC. Alex. Hi. Hi. Welcome back, Chief Minister. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, 
are you able to just tell us how, quite, how bad your symptoms got, if you don't mind me asking? Did, did, did your symptoms fall in line with those that we typically hear are associated with the coronavirus, or the affliction of the lungs, the fever, the loss of sense of taste and smell? How was it? Yeah, well, I think the fever for me, um, Alex, was the, was the toughest part. I had a fever for about a week. Um, it got up to 29 and... Um, or should I say 39, not 29, 39, which, um, you know, you couldn't sleep properly for a week. That, that to me, was the toughest part. A tickly cough came along, and, yes, I lost my taste for four or five days, but it, it was the temperature that really um, caused me um, the concern for the first week anyway. I was still able to chair meetings, but it was um, I was having to rest for three, four hours after I'd chaired a meeting. It was very draining, and then in the second week, I did a little bit of physical work in the garden, uh, 10 minutes and I'd be absolutely wrecked. And then every day I tried to do a little bit more just to build my strength up. So I'm not back to 100%. I think it's going to take longer than that. But um, I am up on my feet and um, you know feeling so much better than when I started. Obviously, I've been very lucky from those people that have had to go into hospital and um, maybe the people that don't show any symptoms are being even luckier than me, but I'm delighted to be back and, and over it. Thank you very much. And obviously, it's good to see you back, a, a cause for celebration. There was, in fact, a celebratory tone to your announcement just there that some of these restrictions, which we've all had to get used to for the last few weeks, are to be slightly relaxed. Do we think perhaps it might be too early to, to celebrate this event, given that the Isle of Man, in your own words, may still not be at its peak? Yeah, it, it's too early to celebrate. This is just a step. We, we, I've been saying from day one, this is all about taking small steps in the right direction as we go a, 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 come a fight, I, I suppose, the coronavirus on the Isle of Man. We are in a really good position at this moment in time where we have capacity in our medical facilities, our hospitals, we've got the, the tracing, the... Um, testing right but we can't be complacent so this is us dipping our toe in the water and allowing a certain sector back to work but equally if we find out in eight to ten days time that it hasn't worked then of course we won't hesitate to um, review that situation and make changes so it's just taking it a step forward at a time but in a controlled measure with the very best of data when we started this we didn't know where we were with the, with the curve with the number of cases we have we now know where we are we've now got our testing capacity up to 200 we've got our oxygen supplies more or less ready to go we've got our ppe equipment sorted so and our staffing in the hospital is at, is at a good position so we can now start to try um, allowing sectors back and then we'll review it and if it's a success and the the figures don't spike then we'll be able to maybe look at the next phase which we've been working on for other sectors. Thank you. Thanks very much Alex and next we have Sam from Alaman Newspapers. Sam nice to see you again. Uh, nice to see you Chief Minister so still muted there. Um, I just start with construction workers then going back to uh, going back to work. In terms of, of that, then with the schools still being closed, if those who cannot go to work because they're looking after children, will they still be able to benefit from the um, government schemes to ensure they're not losing out on money where their colleagues can work? Yeah, and that's one we are working up as as we speak. I know the uh, Minister for Education, Sport and Culture, Sam, is going to be meeting with our teachers to have a general discussion on this to see how we can work bringing, if we need to bring in the um, children of those sectors that, that are going back. So that's been worked up as we speak. Obviously, we need to do this together in a joined up way. And that's the sort of information I would look to be giving you in the next few days, Sam. Thank you. And secondly, I know there's people who are currently in the, uh, the Comus Hotel who are listening. And I just wondered what the second um, group of, of returnees are due tomorrow. What have we learned in the past week that can perhaps be done to improve the situation for people? And how is it going to work in terms of two groups being there? Is that going to change any of the dynamic that's been in place for people who are currently there? 
Well, I was led to believe, and I, I obviously I've been out of the loop on certain things, that we were um, going to another hotel for the, the second, so we would have two different groups. But I maybe invite Minister Ashford to come in and see if he's got any further details on that. David. Thank you, Chief Minister. In relation to that, Sam, um, I know the initial plan with the repatriation was that two different hotels would be used for different groups, so we'd keep it on a cycle. Um, I don't know if that's still the plan because the repatriation has moved from DHSC to um, DOI now, um, but certainly that was the initial plan that it would be two different hotels that would be used and then it would cycle round. Yeah, I understand the second hotel is now being used by a charity, uh, the one on the south of the island there. Um, so when did it move to DOI and what's the purpose? Well, 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 the, well the, hotel, the hotel, just for clarity, wasn't in the south of the island, what was supposed to be the second hotel. Um, oh, sorry, so it's, it's, I think, you, I think we've got the wrong hotel there. But in relation, um, but in relation to DOI, um, the, obviously it involves multiple government departments, DHSC, Cabinet Office, DOI. Um, DOI deals with all the logistics, so it was thought sensible that DOI should hold the virus for the repatriation, and that was done via one of the emergency orders orders recently. Thank you. As I say, going along, um, we're making changes and improvements all the time. We are living in a world that we've never lived before from a fighting this virus, Sam. And obviously, if there are lessons to be learned on how we can improve the, the situation, the experience for those that are being repat repatriated to the island, then of course, I will ensure that everything that can be done to make it a, a much smoother and easier experience for everyone will be implemented as soon as possible. So thank you, Sam, for, for that. Right, if we move on to Amanda from Jeff the Mongoose. Amanda. Thank you, Chief Minister, and welcome back. Thank you very much. Thank you for telling us about those details about the changes in measures. I think people understand the need for border closures, but the lack of certainty over borders reopening is difficult. Are you able to give us any rough timeline for borders to reopen, even if partially with the new data you have? Not really, I'm afraid, Amanda. It's really dependent on the United Kingdom. If you look at the level of infections, it's still um, 4,000 a day. Uh, sadly, the deaths are in the hundreds a day. and we have to ensure that the um, UK is in, a, in a, a, a better place, I suppose, for want of a better word, before we can start to review our border situation. Now, obviously, nothing would give me greater pleasure than to um, open our borders up, but we have to do it in a way that when we know the data is correct and that we're not going to be bringing a second wave of coronavirus onto our island. So I'm afraid I can't give you any date whatsoever, other than to say that our medics will obviously be reviewing this on a regular basis, looking at the data and the analysis that they have, and they will then be advising the Council of Ministers on a, on a way forward if we need to change our, our border control. Thank you. And for our second question, it's about blood therapy, which is potentially going to be trialled with the hope of the antibodies of those who've recovered helping new patients fight off the coronavirus. Is this something you're following closely on the island and what is your take on the idea? Right, well, our, our public health team, um, Dr Henrietta Hewitt, will be looking at this along with Catherine Megson from the um, our chief executive for the Department of Health and Social Care. They haven't advised me on their latest thinking, but when we next have one of them on um, doing the interviews with us, I'll make sure that they're um, ready to, to give you that update, Amanda. So Thank as you. I haven't answered your question properly, would you like to hit me with a, a third one? <laughs> Well, it's actually another it's another health question. I just wondered, with again with these changes in place, if there's any update on the planned restart of cancer treatments in the island. Well, that's obviously what we're looking at. I think we've we've taken a step forward now on letting certain sectors back. Um, we, we really need to look at the data on the next eight to ten days to decide where um, what's happened. If everyone's been responsible and it's worked well, and we haven't seen a spike, then. Um, we can start looking at uh, certain changes. That said, we have had to radically alter. We've been planning for this since January and we've had to make significant changes up at Nobles Hospital to prepare it for the um, pandemic of the coronavirus. And therefore, it's not a quick, 
easy solution to flick back to doing um, elective surgery or other treatment again, Amanda. So it's not something I can say, yeah, we'll have that done in the next week to 10 days, I'm afraid. It's going to take longer. I think we, we're going to have to see the next eight to 10 days how these changes that we've uh, well, that we're proposing to implement from Friday, how they go, and then we will be able to um, start to look at uh, more long-term um, changes, Amanda. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, we have Tim Glover from Manx Radio. Tim, nice to see you. Good to see you, Chief Minister, and looking well too. Um, I think in Tim World, you gave some figures out about the the capacity of the hospital was. And correct me if I was I've taken these figures down wrong. Eighty percent was the capacity at the hospital, and ninety percent at the uh, ICU. The reason I ask is that many experts out there are saying, with the easing of restrictions, it really depends on the strength that the uh, hospital and healthcare you have. So you're, you're happy with those figures. Yes, I, I don't think there's too many countries in the world that would be able to say that they have 90% capacity in hospital beds and 80% in the ICU. Um, and therefore, um, that has helped us enable us to make some of the changes going forward, along with the testing capacity increase and um, the, the, the fact that the curve is pretty flat at this moment in time. So obviously we can't be complacent. I, I must stress that time and time again. This is a step uh, of, of a next stage. It's not the end. We are just in enabling a certain sector to go back. We'll review the information after eight to ten days of data to see what's happened. And then we have other sectors that we've um, planned that could go back and changes that could be made if this works. But um, we can only do it because we have that sort of capacity at, at our hospital and the fact that our, our staff are doing a tremendous job there and um, the, the sickness levels amongst our healthcare workers is exceptionally low at this moment in time, um, which I think you heard um, the, yesterday from the sister that came in to speak to you. So these are all good positions to be in. But again, we cannot be complacent. Tim. We are doing this as a stage the next stage, and then we'll review. And I notice in a, a written answer to a Timor question, uh, it's possible for emergency regulations to continue in operation after the end of the state of emergency, which I think is currently to the 15th of May, uh, for a maximum of six months with Timor approval. Could you expand on that aspect as well? Well, what we do is we obviously prepare the documentation for the Lieutenant Governor to, to declare, to do the edict that there is a state of emergency. We, we just have to plan to, and that's not, we're not trying to make out it's going to be six months time that we've still got to have all this emergency planning, but obviously it would be foolish of the government not to be ready to have a system in place to enable us to do this sort of emergency legislation and keep these measures in place. So I wouldn't read anything into the six months period that was mentioned today, Tim. Thank you very much indeed. Right now we go to Rob and 3FM. Rob, you need to take yourself off mute, Rob. Oh, oh I've just been unmuted there. It's um, very good to see you again. Um, yeah, nice to see, to see you, Rob. You're doing well. Um, first of all, we've had a call off someone in the construction trade today and he's been told that his insurance won't be valid for his employees if he sends them back to work, regardless of if these restrictions are being relaxed on Friday. I just wondered if you could provide some clarity on the situation around that. And if this is going to be the case, why are these workers being allowed to go back to work? If there is that uncertainty over the protection they're getting? Yeah, well, I, I, funny enough, I, I had heard something similar on, on, on this one, Rob. And when we looked into it, we, got, we asked Department for Enterprise to look into this because they liaise with the construction. All construction businesses must be able to do a safety analysis off their site and it will be up to the, their individual insurance relationship to ensure that they are covered for the safety on the site. So um, that was the, the, the view we got back from the um, insurance and construction sector. So that's not saying there's no insurance out there. It will be up to the companies to work with their insurance companies to ensure that they have the correct safety measures and social distancing uh, measures in place. Thank you. Um, my second question, if these, um, some of these restrictions are going to be slightly relaxed on Friday, and if that's going to be the case for more going forward, depending on the scenario, uh, quite simply, how 
is the government and respective authorities going to police this to make sure that people are still being very responsible and sticking to the other restrictions while this is happening? Because as you've mentioned before, obviously one of the worst things that could happen is that we get a second wave of infection and it could undo plenty of the hard work that the vast majority of people on the island have done. Well, first and foremost, obviously, Rob, we're going to have the data. We'll, we'll be testing and tracing every day. Um, so that will obviously tell us whether there's a spike or not. It'll also tell us where the problem is if we do get a spike and we will be able to take action. But I put my faith in the people of the Isle of Man. They have responded fantastically to the measures that we've introduced, the social distancing They've flattened the curve. They really have worked exceptionally hard and taken this really seriously. And we felt we could trust the people of the Isle of Man to, 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 to continue to work together to go forward in a sensible way. And obviously the, the Department of the Environment, Food and Agriculture with their public health, environmental health, I should say, and um, DFE with the construction side, they will be monitoring closely and um, Home Affairs, the work that people are doing and ensuring that they carry it out in a sensible and, and safe way. But at some stage, we, we have to put our trust in people. And I think the Manx public have shown that they can definitely be trusted. And I'm very confident, as much as I can be, I should say, that this will work well. But we, we still have to ensure we do the social distancing, that we wash our hands, where possible we stay at home, where possible we continue to work from home. This is a, a step forward and as I say with all the data we've got we will be able to see whether there is a spike and whether this whether there's a problem and we will be able to tell but with our cust cluster tracing whether or not a, a certain area or a certain industry is causing that problem and we will we will take action. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And last but not least, we have Mr. Moulton from MTTV. Paul. Last again. I, I don't know what's going on here. Anyway, welcome back, sir. Um, can you just put a bit more meat on the bones about this um, restrictions being lifted? For instance, can you get in your car and drive from Ramsey to your favourite garden centre and, and things like that? I mean, can people go as far as they want? And, uh, you know, that, that sort of thing will happen, won't it? And therefore, the police will be a bit difficult to know what, who to stop and on what reasoning. Well, we're asking people to be sensible. You know, I, I think we, we find ourselves in a position where we have flattened the curve. And whilst um, our, our managers and all our hardworking team in the Department of Health and Social Care and all the other cross-government, third-sector um, workers can take some credit, it is down to the Manx public for respecting the rules and regulations that we brought in that have got us into this position. Now, obviously, if there are abuses, action will be taken. Over the coming days, we will be giving far more detail on how this will work and what you can and cannot do. And that will be put on our website. And obviously, over the coming days, we will be announcing it in our press conferences. So it really will be down to the sensibleness of the Manx population. But the Manx population have been shown that they can be trusted. We share as much information with you as possible because we have a good relationship. And let's um, as, as, let, let, let's not play down the, 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 the goodness of the Manx population and what they've done to get us there. So I think people will stay, will be sensible. They won't abuse this. And we will give greater detail as we go along. And if I can speak to David, I just want some drilling down on those figures today, Mr Ashford, if that's possible. I think you said seven new cases. Could you uh, clarify if that's clusters or is it, you know, it's a tracing or new or, or whatever? Can, can you give us some information OK, I'll bring David on that. In. Thank you, David. Hello, Paul. Yes, seven new cases today. Um, it's not a cluster of cases. It's spread across the island, I believe, um, from the information I have. So there's nothing tying those cases together as far as I'm aware. So still we have a problem, basically. New, new cases are, are coming forward. Which well, there, will, there will linked. be, as I've said, there will be new cases. And I think the important yeah. thing to emphasise, Paul, is what I've emphasised before at press conferences. We've got to get away from the obsession of daily data. What mm -hmm. matters isn't the daily data because we will have cases where on some days there's 12 new cases, other days there's one or two. What matters is exactly what the Chief Minister has been referring to throughout the press conference today. It's that trend line. 
So where we, uh, you know, I think I've said here before, although we see graphs with lovely smooth curves, which is always the way things are planned, life isn't a smooth curve. Um, life has peaks and troughs in real life, and that's exactly what we will see day in, day out. We'll see some days of seven cases, some days of one cases. It's that trend that matters, and the trend at the moment, I'm naturally cautious by nature, as you know, Paul, but the data is looking better than we were expecting. Um, but it is important, as the Chief Minister has said, that we now take baby steps forward in any relaxation and that people continue to abide by the rules. I mean, if there's any ideally, it's, it's better to have a cluster, is it not? Because therefore you're containing it. But these are people all over again. So you still need more tracing to go on, don't you? So there needs to be more tracing. But the thing is, the key point of what we've done differently here in the island to many jurisdictions, if we have continuously kept that community testing in place, so we are continuously tracing, we are continuously breaking the chain of this virus, and that is the absolutely crucial thing. Many jurisdictions stopped community testing and they lost track of the virus in their communities. We haven't done that. And Chris, I see the breakdown on ventilators. How are we doing? Um, in, in what sense, Paul? How many people are on ventilators now? Um, I believe one. Right, thank you. Right. Well, I've got a few hands up for, um, I don't think it's waving me by, it's asking for another question. So um, if we go to, um, Chris, do you have another question? Uh, yes, thank you, Chief Minister. Many people will be delighted with the announcement you've made this afternoon. One person who doesn't appear to be is the Speaker of the House of Keys. He's expressed his disappointment that you've decided to tell the press and the Manx public your decision to ease restrictions before informing Tinwald members. It's quite a strongly worded statement from Mr Watterson, who says it makes the Council of Ministers look like they have contempt for Tinwald. Why did the announcements this afternoon not form part of your statement to Tinwald this morning? Um, well, I'm disappointed to hear those comments. I, I think um, the Treasury Minister gave a briefing to all Tinwald members um, which we, 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 try, we try as a Council of Ministers to give departmental updates behind the scenes to all um, Timble members so that they are well aware of the views of the Council of Ministers on, on where we're going, etc. And the Treasury Minister did give um, an update to um, Timble members that we would be looking to relax um, and allow, not necessarily relax, but make the next stage, the next changes going forward as long as the data... Um, continued and, to, and today and, and for, the, for the rest of the week. Obviously, this isn't happening till Friday. We will still have to look at the data um, as, as it comes in to make sure that we can make these changes. So um, a briefing had been given intimating that change would, would be happening. So disappointed, but it wasn't intentional to... I've always valued um, the relationship with all Timbald members to ensure they, they are fully in, in, you know, aware of what's going on. Right, um, Alex, did you have another question? There we go, you should be unmuted now. Yeah, Yeah. just one more. Um, you say construction and related industries will be going back to work. How far does that stretch to public national infrastructure projects like Douglas Promenade? Will we see crews back on the prom? Well, obviously this has been worked on at the moment, Alex, so I can't give you the exact detail on the, whether the promenade will be um, starting up again next week. I will um, give you that information. Um, I'm, I'm sure the DOI minister will be working on it as we speak. So that will be something that we can um, let you know as in the next couple of days. Thank you. Um, Sam, did you have another question? Uh, yes, Chief Minister. Um, one of the more controversial aspects of places that were closed was uh, cemeteries, particularly over Easter Sunday. Is that going to be able to be relaxed so people are able to visit the gravesides of their relatives in the coming, um, after this week? Yeah, that's been um, worked on as we speak, Sam, and, and will be announced in the next couple of days, details on that. But we will be making announcements on going into cemeteries. But equally, it's um, obviously the churches own the cemeteries, so we'll be working with them. So we'll be giving you more information in the next couple of days. Um, Amanda, did you have another question at all? 
Um, we had a question about um, financial assistance uh, for construction workers. If they can't or are unable to go back to work for certain reasons, maybe insurance or down to childcare or anything along those lines, um, will they still be able to have financial assistance by the support schemes? Yeah, well, obviously that'll be something they'll need to work with Treasury and the Department for Enterprise on that. So if they have a problem, I would suggest that they contact the usual um, number at the Department for Enterprise in, in the construction sector to get the latest thinking on that. I'm sure if they can prove that they have a major problem that they can't get round, then they will be looked upon fav favourably, Amanda. Um, Tim, did you have an extra question? Yes, just a quick one. I know you said the uh, measures will be announced in the sectors and everything, but these sort of announcements inevitably lead people to uh, start firing questions in. And the one we've got the most is, is the 40 mile an hour speed limit to remain? Yes, the 40 mile an hour speed limit is to remain. We've seen a significant drop in the number of accidents and people having to be taken up to Nobles Hospital. And as a result of that, that has freed up the bed space that, um, you, you know, one major accident could see seven beds taken up, Tim and a major surgery having to take place. So the 40 mile an hour speed limit will, will remain, Tim. Um, Rob, did you have a question? Uh, yes, please. Uh, yes, please, Chief Minister. Um, just with regards to, again, the relaxation around the exercise, obviously we've had the constabulary out who have been able to issue fines for those breaching social distancing <laughs> rules. Um, what changes does this mean for the constabulary in terms of what reasons they can find people for while they're out because there may be people worried that they may get you know, stopped by officers may not know what their rights are well you still should not be um so you should be you should not be going out with anyone other than your immediate family so so that is the rule so if you're we had one instance of people sitting on the prom wall having a drink with a number of others that was a clear breach of the social distancing rules that nothing's changed there it's just that you are being allowed to have maybe slightly longer out in, in your exercise, if you wish, but you still have to keep your distance from other people who are not members of your immediate household. So there's no change there whatsoever. It's just that you will be given longer to exercise, and as long as this is being treated sensibly by members of the public. Um, Paul, MTV. This this might be the and finally one for you. Did you find out how you got it? Did you get tested in the sense of uh, any fee, you know, checking on the clusters and who you, who it possibly might have been that passed it on to you and then who you might have passed it on to? No, I, I, I don't know who um, gave it to me, Paul. It, it's just one of those things. I, I, as Chief Minister, I, I would meet a lot of people, but um, it, it's just one of those things. So, no, no, no um, knowledge there whatsoever. But I'm just glad that I'm over it. I'm, I'm back and um, here to, to see you all happy smiley faces. Well, thank you all again for your patience. I, I won't do shout outs today. You've probably heard enough of my voice for one day, but please remember for today, tomorrow and the next day, please stay at home. We need these few more days. From Friday, stay at home if you can. It could still save lives, but we will be trusting you to make the right choices for your families, for your community, for your island. Please keep up your remarkable efforts. Stay safe, save lives. Thank you all very much.